is going to be a great evening because we are talking about creative financing in times of distress. My name is Steve Peterson. I run Infinity Investments, which is a commercial real estate brokerage and investment firm. I started in November 2009, right in Oakland. And even though this office is in San Leandro, this is still open, yeah. open here. <laughs> and let me tell you all something about this space, that this is, uh, this is called the Chambers Complex. And this is owned by um, Paul Chambers, who runs Chambers General Construction. And up in the front is our office where our real estate company is, Chambers General Construction. But also back here, you have Art Clark, who uh, is an architect. And there's a, a sister who runs a, a tax practice. On the corner, there is a Greenwood Express, which is like a independent UPS store. All of those businesses that I just pointed out, these are all black owned businesses. We got a little mini black Wall Street up in here uh, in, in, uh, in San Leandro on the border of East Oakland. So we're very glad that you could join us here this evening. Now, this is we're gonna we're gonna this will be about an hour long presentation. We'll have some questions because it's a lot of you. I would say hold your questions until the end, unless unless you got a burning desire and you need to get that question answered. You know, go ahead and raise your hands and I'll get to it. But try to wait wait to the end because I'm gonna kind of cut it off right about seven ten. Be about ten minutes for questions. Couple minutes for some refreshments and networking. Networking, right? How many of y'all remember that? That we are in a in a physical location with other people. It's been a while. Yeah. The last six months or so, we've been able to get up and do that. I kind of started my career and built my career on networking. A few of you uh, people see the in here come to several of these meetings, and we've been doing this from we started in Jack London. We was in West Oakland. We was downtown here in a couple different locations here in San Leandro. We've been on Zoom. And we're gonna we're gonna keep going, but it's really great to be back in uh, person and, and on live because we uh, we got people on IG on Instagram live that's listening to this. This will be recorded and also on YouTube. All right. So the tonight's topic: creative financing. Right. Let me, uh, just a little bit about myself. Now I won't spend too much time because I want to talk about this. But I told you guys I started in November '09. Right? That was a very interesting time to start a business. However, however, that was a great time to start a business, especially in the commercial real estate industry, right? Because that prices were down, right? It was real estate, it was foreclosures everywhere, and rent had only came down a little bit. A little bit. And then immediately they went back up. But it was very difficult to do deals at that point in time, right? But for me, I saw an opportunity. As the economy changed, it created an opportunity for me, someone who was in the commercial real estate industry, as a young buck just trying to figure things out, all of a sudden, there was a lot of openings where those openings were, did not exist before, right? And but because the price points were such, many of the investment banks, investors, and people in the industry just simply were not there. Time to get a couple of chairs. So we started in 09. And we've, we've got a couple of chairs up here. He's gonna go get another chair. Yep. So I started then, you know, Infinity in, in Investments. I've been in the industry since 2003, though. So I saw the run up, I saw the, the crash out, I saw the fallout, all of those things, right? And we started a company in there. But what I also did that I'm gonna share with you all is I got heavily involved in a few real estate organizations. And this has helped me tremendously to build my network, to serve the community, and develop my executive skill sets. So I served as president for the Associated Real Property Brokers in Oakland. That's the Oakland chapter of NARAB, National Association of Real Estate Brokers. NARAB is the Black Brokers Association. We were started in 1947, and we are called real tists as opposed to real tours. And what that is is because the real tours wouldn't let us in their little club back in those days, uh, blacks and other minorities. So we formed the real tists. And so we stand for democracy and housing. And so I had that honor to serve as president of ARPB in 2015 and 2016. Follow that up with the presidency of KRAB. KRAB is the California board of NARAB. It's a state board. Uh, NARAB, I believe, we have five state boards, five states that are big enough to have California, Texas, uh, Florida, Georgia, and I'm, I'm missing one. But five states where we have boards, and maybe even more now. And so I had that honor and pleasure to serve between 2017 and 2018. And let me, got, let me tell you something very interesting when we did this, a lot of that work. We championed what was called the A1 
A1 housing bond. It was Ron Bonta, who was our current state um, senator, who at the time was our, our local area's uh, state assemblyman. And he was championing this bond. Oh, A1 housing bond, Alameda County, half a billion dollars for housing. 100 million for down payment assistance, and then four, 400 million for affordable housing. So what they would do is come talk to organizations like us, and we would go talk to our senators, our assembly people, and, and champion for this. That's, that was part of the advocacy that we, worked, that we would do at ARPB, KRAB, and ARAB. Well, uh, one of my agents is writing an offer today, one of our clients, and they are using what's called the AC Boost Down Payment Assistance Program. And AC Boost is funded through the A1 housing bond. And so I bring all that to your attention because it's very important that you network and that you be a part of networks and then actually if you have an opportunity to advocate for a cause that you feel importantly about, that you go ahead and do that. All right, very, very important. Now, on the flip side, and I'll get into this, I also served as president in 2018 as, uh, for NorCal CCIM. CCIM stands for Certified Commercial Investment Members. The pin I wear right here is the designation that you get. You gotta do a bunch of classes. I closed a bunch of deals, and I was the first black president of that organization. I've closed over $20, $30 million of transactions through that organization. So, if there's one thing you do here tonight, make sure you network with the person that you're sitting right to your right or to your left, because networking, being a part of networks is huge. And by the way, that is a big part of how you will be able to close creative financing deals. Now, enough about me. Why creative financing? All right? And you may not be able to see exactly the words on it, so I'll articulate it. And by the way, make sure there's a sign-in sheet. Make sure you sign that sign-in sheet so that you can get a copy of this presentation. All right? Why creative financing? You know, right now, anybody, we'll be a little interactive right now. Anybody know the current interest rates? We'll start single-family homes or two to, you know, two to four unit. What? Three point five. 3.5 was a little while ago. No. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 A little while ago. Yeah. 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 It's like 7%. Yeah. 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 5.9%. 5.7. 5.7, right? And those, those are for probably a paper or, or, you know, every one thing about interest rates, you guys, every lender is not the same. So just check that out. I mean, lenders can, can vary quarter percent, half a percent. I've seen somebody in... Same month, close a seven and a quarter on two or four units, not a single family, but two, four. Seven and a quarter, same month, 5.9. Mm -hmm. That's that's a one and uh, uh, three, what is it? One and uh, uh, 0.3% difference, same month, all right? Different lenders, different borrowers. Now that was residential. How about commercial? Anybody know the rates? Give, give me a rate on commercial. Which by the way, the first time in history in this era of time that I can remember since I've been in the game since 03, where on average, now on average, commercial rates are lower than a residential. Hmm. On average, though. Starting to, starting to shift, and I think we'll see commercial rates go above residential rates. Actually, in the next couple months, I think we'll see that. Five and a quarter. Five and a quarter. Five and a half. Six and a quarter. Wow. Six and a half. Depends on what you're doing. If you're buying an apartment building in East Oakland versus if you're buying an apartment building by the lake, those rates may be different, all right? They price things. If you're a borrower and you're worth 100 million versus you're a borrower and you're worth 500,000, your rates are gonna be different. If you go walk into First Republic Bank and you got a million dollars in your in their bank, your rate, your rate is gonna be different than if you got, you know, hundred thousand dollars and you you know and you're putting investors together and you ain't got no money in their bank, right? So rates are gonna vary. But rates are pretty high right now, would y'all agree? Yeah. Now, in relation to where they were last year, rates historically where they're at right now, actually not that big of a deal. You know, my big mama, my grandmother, bought her home in, I want to say the 70s, and her rate was 19%, <laughs> right? You know, and she wasn't worried about it because that's what everybody else was paying, all right? So, so keep that in mind, right? We get, we get, oh, 6%, 6%. The reason why 6% and five and a quarter seems a lot because we was just in three and a half, right? You know, so, why creative financing is number one, we can create financing where maybe the rates are better than the banks. <clears throat> However, that's today, that's, that's a market timing piece. That's a right now piece, right? Another, what's called evergreen, meaning that's always gonna be this way, 
right? reason that you can create that creative finance is important is that maybe the property that you're looking at is not what's called stabilized, it's not fully occupied, right? So if it's not stabilized, fully occupied, most lenders are not going to lend on it. You have to go to private money. And if the seller wants to sell that property, they're probably going to have to take a discount in terms of price. So a way that we can bridge that gap is for the seller to carry financing, right? The seller to carry paper. Property's vacant, property needs work. A lot of lenders are not going to lend on that. And if they are, it's got to be at a price point that's going to make some sense, right? So for the sellers of the world out there, seller financing actually on their end can be a very great way to help them get closer to their price and help them to get what they're looking for, right? In terms of getting a deal done, right? Don't. Now, another piece that's also evergreen is taxes, tax implications. If you sell a property and you do not exchange, talking investment property now, and the investment property, by the way, if you own your business and you own that property, that's an investment property or what's called business purpose property. Either way it goes. If you sell and you don't exchange, you're going to have capital gains liabilities, right? And we're in this golden state of California where Uncle Sam is at 21%, and then Uncle Gavin and them is at at least nine and a quarter, or I think it's nine and a half, actually, and then beyond. So you're paying 30% capital, make a million dollars, you actually made $700,000, unless you exchange. But if maybe you don't want to exchange, meaning that you do a tax-deferred exchange, you put your money in a, a qualified intermediary, and then you go buy another property, you follow those rules, if you don't want to do that, then you are going to get hit with those taxes, if it's in commercial investment property. So, if the seller were to carry financing on the amount that they carry, they're not realizing that capital gain, you know, and they can, they can take less of a hit in terms of what they would have to pay. So, those are some great reasons in terms of why a seller might want to carry financing, do creative financing. As for buyers, I could, go, I could write a book, and maybe I'll do that one day. Uh, in fact, there was a, several books, and there's a great course that got me in real estate called The Carlton Sheets No Money Down. Was anybody, anybody remember that one? <laughs> Still got it, right? It's one of the best courses in real estate, period, because it ta he talks about all the different creative financing strategies, and I'll get into some of that. But also, he talks about how to analyze properties, how to analyze markets, how to analyze rents. It's a really good course, right? And there's a million different ways we as buyers, you know, would want to do creative finance, Right? You can essentially, and there's the idea of no money down. Now, even no money down deals typically take a little bit of money. My first deal in real estate ever was a six-unit apartment building in Pueblo, Colorado. We did a master lease option, and we had to put a, uh, you know, I had to, when you do a lease option, you have to be something called option consideration. You got to put up a little bit of money to bind the contract, and that little bit of money is, is non-refundable. It's an option consideration. It goes towards the purchase price, right? There has to be something. So maybe it's not... 10% down, 20% down, or so forth. It could be as much as a dollar. On my first deal, there was actually, I needed a dollar. Now, it was a true money, no money down deal though. Because when I did that deal, it was 2003, uh, uh, what was I, I've just turned 21, I didn't have a dollar. I was in Pueblo, Colorado, visiting my dad. He, 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 we pulled up at a coffee shop. I said, Dad, I'm going here handling this business. I'm talking to the man. He said, okay, it's all good. We signed the paper. He said, I just need a dollar now. I said, okay, great. Realized I didn't have a dollar. So I went out to Pops and, and, and he gave me four nickels, uh, four quarters, and we made it happen, right? But there was, there was no money down, but still there had to be value exchange in that, in that deal. Now, that's an example of what can happen. And low, no money down can also mean low money down. So a lot of times there has to be some sort of value exchange in a creative finance situation. But it doesn't, doesn't mean that there is no money being transferred, all right? So the list could go on and on as to why we as buyers, I wanted to map out, well, why in the world would a seller do that? Now, if you go into other states, and I know Yana does a lot, you do a lot in the South, Southeast, seller financing is more prevalent. Although a lot of the states in the last five, 10 years have got really, really hot. In California, it's always been more difficult to do seller financing because banks, financial institutions, everybody loves California real estate to lend on. There's pl plenty of money, all cash, a lot of cash. So to get a seller to finance a deal like in 2021, that was going to be hard, right? Because the seller could just say, why would I finance it? I put it on the market, I got 10 offers, 100 grand, 200 grand above my, why would I finance you? Okay, fast forward to 2023. 
I, I look today, I've seen several properties on the market the past six months, right? They might, they, they might consider it. I've closed three, four, tra three transactions in the last two quarters that involve seller financing. You know, we're negotiating, we're negotiating on a couple of those right now. All right, so those, th just a couple of ideas as to why this whole thing is important. Now, agents and brokers, I know we got a few of y'all in here. Understand that we can also get paid. We can get paid when we do a lease option to buy, a master lease option to buy, a land contract, a wraparound mortgage. I've done several of these transactions as a broker and made money as a broker. Now, it may require you breaking up your commission or minimizing your commission, but it can be done. And I, wa I wanted to make that clear because a lot of times the agents and the brokers of the world don't know how to structure deals. And so we are the gatekeepers, right? Sellers entrust us to sell their properties. Buyers look at us to advise them through the process. And so a lot of times if you're not educated to that, then you may miss some opportunities, all right? When the interest rates go up and when the economy changes, all right, there's opportunities. And what I think that's different about this marketplace than the last time the market crashed is that a lot of people have that. We haven't seen, we, and we, I don't think we've seen a market crash. We've seen, we've definitely seen a correction in prices for sure. It crashed 50 to 70% off the values last time. And we was eating beans and rice and top ramen for a couple months. For real, right? Did we not there. We are not there, right? We are in a shift. And so now I'm seeing properties be marketed with seller financing on a regular basis. I'm seeing properties be marketed. Hey, we have an assumable loan. You could assume our loan because it's three and a quarter percent interest rate. You might go to the First Republic Bank and get 5%, but you can come in here three and a quarter, right? People are marketing that. So those, I wanted to set the stage as to why, right? It's not just, I ain't got no money. I need to make something happen. Now, when I first got in the game, that was, I ain't had no money. I had to make something happen, right? Now, in order to do that, though, even if you don't have the, no money, you have to have some understanding about finance as it relates to this. And I'm going to go through this, all right? And in this era of time, people have equity. All right, we've had this big run-up in value. We have not had a 70% crash. We have a bunch of people who have equity in their property who maybe are trying to sell the property and it's stuck, okay? Residential is a little bit different than commercial in this way, right? The income is very, very important to the value of commercial real estate. Anything five plus units and above apartment, that's commercial real estate, all right? Office, retail, industrial, that's commercial real estate. Two to four unit buildings can be in that space if it's purely investment. Two to four unit buildings, like what I'm selling on, on, on Hillside right now, though, took me forever to get in a contract, but the owner is gonna live in one of the units. So that's a different consideration than if he was just purely going to buy that four unit building and rent it out for the income. The reason that's a different consideration is if you're going to, let me ask y'all a question. If you're going to buy a property for income, would it be important that you make income every month on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you buy a property on purpose and you said, my purpose for buying this property is to generate income. Would you do that if your purpose is to make income, but you ain't making it, you got to, you got to pay that property every month. Would that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So the challenge we're having today is that many properties, the yields on many properties, the return, we call it the capitalization rate, is lower than the interest rate. So the cost of the money on that property is higher than the rate of return on that property. Right. In general, every property is different, but in the general in the marketplace, that there's an imbalance. So what happens now as a result of that is that is stagnation. The amount of transactions that are happening in this world is down. Now, residential, okay, when someone's going to buy a home, it's a little bit different, but it's similar because they have to go and buy a home and get a mortgage, right? And that mortgage is their, their monthly payment. When that monthly payment raise, raise, rises up substantially, right, they got a certain amount of income, they, will, they can only qualify for so much, right? And that may, maybe they can come with more cash, maybe they can do, you know, all that kind of stuff. But in commercial investment property, that income is critical because that's the whole purpose why they buy the property. You know what I mean? Now, if you're buying a business for your business purpose, that might be a little bit different because you're buying it for your, your to run your company from there, right? If you're buying it to run your company, that's a little bit different than if I'm buying for income, right? So just keep that in mind. So I wanted to set the stage. Now, what we're talking about is creative financing in times of distress, right? Now, 
I'm going to get into what is creative financing, but I want to talk about times of distress. All right, and, and I, this presentation is designed for creative finance. I'm going to go through that. The times of distress piece, I'm going to, I'm going to ad lib throughout this presentation. All right, what does distress mean? There's different elements of distress. All right, at different elements of this. Obviously, short sales. Uh, excuse me, I'll give you the short sales, but somebody being uh, behind on their mortgage. Now understand, being behind on your mortgage is different than having a default filed on your mortgage. All right? Mm -hmm. um, you could be several months behind on your mortgage and not have a notice of default filed on your property. You understand? Mm -hmm. The bank, after 30 days, they can file a foreclosure on you if they so choose. They can file what's called a notice of default, state of California. All right? And then after that, 90 days, so, when, so that's, nope. Behind on the payments is one piece, right? Now, typically, most lenders are going to work with you for a couple months. They're going to work with you for a couple months in order, in order to not have to file the fault. They don't want, banks typically do not want to foreclose a bank. Now, lenders who are not regulated as banks, they might be a little bit of a hard money lender, they don't necessarily mind foreclosure. All right, they're not regulated like a bank. A bank, when they foreclose upon you, is they have to set aside a certain amount of money, and then that money they have to set aside for that property can't be lent out. So they don't ideally want to go in and foreclose upon you, right? Hard money lenders might be different. Okay, so just take that with a grain of salt because we're gonna talk about hard money. So there's different elements of distress. Somebody not paying, somebody get a notice of default. Now, once they file a notice of default, they got 90 days, and then they can file what's called notice of trustee sale. Notice of trustee sale, once they file that, you got 25 days and they're going to then the auction, where they auctioning off your property. Those can be, all those dates can be postponed and you can negotiate a little, but that's typically the foreclosure process, all right? That is hard distress. All right, y'all agree? That's hard to stretch. You got some heartburn. Yeah. Okay, you got to take some antacids. You might have to take some shots. You get you some cannabis or whatever you do to relax. All right, that's hard to stress. Now, what about other types of distress? That what other types of distress could y'all think about in terms of real property? How about divorce? Somebody, everybody went through a divorce, you know? Or I have, I'm happily married as 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 a man, but as a kid, I went through a divorce, and that was pretty traumatic for for us, right? As kids. I can only imagine for my parents, basically with properties and all of this, there are certain agents out there. I met this lady. She was like, I met her at a mixer. And she said, I'm the divorce broker. I was like, man, all right. I, ain't trying, I better stay away from you. you know. But that was what we, it was very interesting because what she had developed was a niche for herself. If you're an agent, you're a broker, you know the important, or really anybody in business, you know the important for developing a niche for yourself, right? You know, like I do multifamily. That's been our big thing. We do all kind of commercial, but that multifamily is our, is our thing. Well, she was a divorce broker. Because she was in the L.A. area, a lot of people get divorced. It's a difficult process. The first property I ever sold was my mama house. Not my dad, but she was on her fifth marriage. You know what I mean? She was, Bob Miles was a, you know, uh, uh, you know, she was a free spirit. She, <laughs> and she didn't take no crap, right? So, but she was on her fifth um, marriage and then fifth divorce. And so I came in, I just got my license. I mean, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm ready to go. And that, that, that process taught me a lot about selling properties in divorce. First of all, it's a pain. Because you're dealing, it's one thing to deal with the, the parties, the divorcees, but it's a, it's a whole other thing when you got the courts coming in, speaking to courts, probate. Have right? you ever been through a probate? Somebody where somebody passes away, they didn't have a will, they didn't have a trust, it goes to the state of California. The state of California is a gangster, they're getting 30 to 40% in fees. Mm -hmm. That's an element of distress. Bankruptcy. Now, when people are in foreclosure, what happens when you're trying to save your property, when what's typical, people don't file bankruptcy up front, they typically will file bankruptcy towards the end, when they're in notice of trustee sale phase. And then they'll file bankruptcy. However, plenty of people file bankruptcy on properties before they, before they get to that, pro that, that's, that point. Or people in business file bankruptcy. Yep. Chair up here. Um, these are all different ways Different elements of distress, you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, don't worry, you come up here. Come on up. I could go on and on 
right? About oh, oh another we talked about divorce. What about people breaking up in terms of partnerships? LLC, some one partner don't like another partner. You know, people have legal trouble, tax trouble, all these types of things. Guess what y'all about to see a lot of in the next couple of years? All of the stuff I just said. Right? I don't think like 2007 or 8, but all of everything that I just mentioned are, are, are mm-hmm. elements of the stress. There's hard distress mm-hmm. when somebody's in foreclosure. There's, I wouldn't say divorce and soft distress, but that's an element of distress. Bankruptcy, business, taxes. Another thing is burnout. Burnout. You know, I know people own properties free and clear. They ain't got no uh, 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 mortgage, but they're burnt out on that property. Mm-hmm. The property can burn you out. Now, another thing is, what about this uh, 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 um, eviction moratorium? You got some people in there that you go to collect your rents. They tell you, we ain't paying you no rents, okay? Huh. You can't do nothing about it. You go in there to fix up a property. They're cursing you out. They're throwing stuff at you. That can be stressful. You know what I mean? Especially if you haven't set things up right or you just you got, a bad, you got a bad deal. So, these creative financing and times of distress is really many times the best solution to get a problem solved. That's I got some slides. I'm gonna go through the slides. I sit, spent the time on this because I want y'all to understand that what we try to do. All right, every property is not gonna be ready to carry financing. Every property is not in distress. All right, you got a pristine, fully occupied property with great rents with a suitable mortgage. You know they probably gonna have five offers even in this time, right? So what you're looking for is opportunities where you can come and solve a, a problem, not necessarily to be an opportunist, mm-hmm. right? And it, you know what I mean by opportunist, and it, there's different ways of looking at that, but don't look to be somebody that's getting over on people. You're looking for it to, to be a sol- problem solver in these deals. And that's the best way I can kind of say that, right? Now, I want to talk about what is creative finance, talk about why, but essentially, Creative financing can take several forms, but it's when the seller, first of all, first part of it, is when the seller takes part of their equity and utilizes that to help finance the deal, right? That could be in a form, and I'll go through the different strategies. That could be in a form of a note. That can be a form of joint venture equity. That can be in a form of, of um, uh, structured finance equity. It can take many forms. It could be in a form of a lease with an option to buy. But they are taking their equity and saying, hey, I don't need all of it right now. I'm going to kind of finance a por- all or a portion of it in order to get a deal done. Right? Another element of creative financing is using other people's money. That's when you go to investors who want to maybe invest with you, individual investors who come in with you and they invest with you in a deal. That's when you maybe go to institutional investors if you have a track record, you have a big enough deal, where they may come in and buy out a stake of, of the property. That's when you go to hard money, maybe your credit's taking a hit, but you found a deal of a lifetime, a bank's not gonna lend you, maybe you have cash, but you got, if say maybe you went through a bankruptcy, this happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, you go through a bankruptcy, maybe you have cash, but the bank ain't giving you no loan, because no, they look and they say, if you have bankruptcy, you check that box, with you out. But if the deal's good enough, that you can go to a private money lender, and they're equity-based lenders, you got down payment cash, boom, you can make the deal work. So essentially, when I'm saying creative financing, I'm not necessarily saying go to the bank and they do some creative stuff, right? That was 2005 to 2006, you know what I mean? And, you know, a lot of people, that was a lot of um, manipulating, a lot of fraud in those days, right? Mm-hmm. What I'm talking about is you utilizing one of two things typically the seller's equity to help you to finance the deal or other people's money to help you to finance the deal. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right, so now that's what we talk about what is it, all right? Talk about the benefits of it. I mean, obviously, you can get it in with a lower down payment or no down payment. No down payment could also be none of your own money. If you have enough, if you find a screaming deal, you got investors, you might not put any money in it. I've had deals that I've done like that. Or put a little bit of your own money in. So you get in with less money, right? You can buy bigger of a bigger property than you can buy by yourself, right? That's really, you know, the big part of it. And, and, and you know that most large commercial real estate transactions, most of them, not some of them, most of them, involve some element of creative finance. But, and especially the big institutions, rarely are, is it one company just coming and saying, hey, I'm going to put all my cash and buy this building. Mm-hmm. Black, Blackstone, the largest 
real estate private equity company. I don't know if they're the largest private equity company, but they're definitely the largest real estate private equity company in the world. Everything they do is with other people's money. Everything they do. All the biggest developers out there, they're doing it with other people's money. You see all these buildings in downtown Oakland, that these new buildings that just got built? There's an element of curated financing, other people's money, syndicated equity, structured finance that is in all of those deals, right? Every single one of them. So it's a way for you to buy something that you couldn't do by yourself. Now, it's also a way for you to increase your rate of return, right? I'm not going to go too much into that, but basically, if you structure your financing in a way where the rates on your um, uh, either the first mortgage and in the, the creative finance second or equity that you put together is less than the rate of return on the property and then you put in less money down, your overall return on that less money is going to be skyrocketing, right? And that is why the big companies of the world use creative finance. Now, we're talking about real estate. I'm just, and I'll just a quick second. Uh, most big people that buy businesses, if you're going to go and buy a business, whether it's a small business or it's a large business, there's some there's some element of creative financing uh, and also in big corporate buyouts, what they call leverage buyouts, stuff like that. They're using uh, other people's money. They're using the, the, the seller's equity as well. So don't think and don't let agents and brokers tell you because a lot of agents and brokers, they don't know this part of the business. Right. And they will try to make you feel as if you ain't got no money. They're trying to belittle you because you're trying to put this deal together now. As an agent and broker, you don't want to have somebody tell you, hey, look, I'm trying to buy a million dollar property, put $5,000 down, I want you to make 20 offers for me. Look, you can't, as an investor, don't approach a broker like that, <laughs> especially somebody that's busy and got business, you know what I mean? Because, okay, that's not, that, that, that's not a symbiotic relationship right there. That's me doing a whole bunch of work for you. You shooting darts, you shooting mud on the table. You have to be specific. That's why you're looking for opportunities where there's an element of distress or a problem that you can solve. Okay, but I just wanted to take some time to talk about some, some of these benefits of creative financing, especially from the buy side, you know. For the seller side, now, we talked about taxes, right? We talked about getting a deal done. Now, another thing to, to, to think about, and this is really for people who do lease with options to buy or land contracts, and I'll talk about these. This is where people are burnt out on the management, or they, they just looking to ride off into the sunset, all right? Anybody, who, who here is, owns and has operates or managed properties before at, at one point in time in your life, all right? It ain't all peaches and cream, you know what I mean? In fact, it's fun to buy properties, it's a blast. You know, managing them is where you gotta roll your sleeves up, all right? And it's not maybe as much fun as we, but, but it is absolutely important part of the business, but it is also a reason why a lot of people are done with it, right? And so, you, however, however, a lot of people, they say, hey, I don't want to exchange. I got to say exchange. I got to go buy another property. I got to do the same thing. I'm, I'm doing it, right? So that may not be the solution for them where they could, they know that property, they know that building, they know that asset. If they like it, but they're done with managing it, they can have it. You could come along, they can lease with option to buy with you. You take over that, you run it. And if you mess up, they get to step back in, they can do it all over again. Versus if they sell the property, they exchange, they got to go buy something else. Which I believe if you follow me, you know I talk about exchanges all the time. It's a great way to build wealth. But if you get to that point where you, like, at that property, like you're ready to not manage it, but you're not ready to go buy something else, doing a creative finance deal can really work. And if you're a buyer looking to structure that deal, you are looking for situations that are like that. You're looking for situations where people, they can, they're overwhelmed, you know what I mean? And they, they need a way out. And in a time like in, in a couple years ago, they could just put their property on the market and it would sell, it would sell quick. Now, that's not necessarily the case, right? So, all of that being said, those are some of the reasons, the benefits, the why, the what, you know, the elements of the stress, the things to look for when you're trying to structure these deals. All right, and so now, let's talk about a couple of rules of thumb as we get into it. Now, in general, and I, I you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but in general, rule of thumb is that we're negotiating for terms. So if you're trying to do a creative finance deal, meaning that your, your main point of negotiations is the terms like uh, 
the amount of that they were carry financing, the length of when they carry finance, as opposed to the price. The price becomes secondary because you, it's very difficult for you to ask somebody to drop their price 50% and to carry finance. I'm just, I'm keeping it real. You know what I mean? That's, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. You know, when you're, when you're saying, hey, we're going to, can you carry some financing? A lot of times sellers are willing to do that because they're trying to get to their price. All right. Now, also, word of caution. Word of caution. I did a lot of deals out of state when I first came up. Which out of state, by the way, can be a great way to make some money. But you got to know what you're doing, right? <laughs> and out of state, seller financing is real prevalent. So when you're going out of state doing deals, you'll see a lot of seller finance, creative financing deals. And a lot of people will say, hey, buy my property a million dollars, I'll carry it. You put 100% down with it. But they may be trying to get more than the property's worth, right? On a case by case basis, you might be able to do that, but nine times out of ten, you still don't want to pay more than it's worth. You can pay a fair price though. You don't have to beat them up on price. Now, very rare is the situation where you beat them up on price and you get seller finance. I've, I'm trying to think of the time where I said I don't really remember one, right? But people trying to, as a seller, beat you up and say, "Hey, I got this lease option to buy. I got this seller finance." You know, but they got some issues with the property and they're overcharging you, right? As the market started to shift last time, 08, 07, I started to see lease options coming, but I started, I saw people being absorbent with their pricing on it, okay? As as things shifted, you saw better deals, right? So just word of the word, word of the wise, you, you, can't, you can't cut people price 50% when you, when, you, when you create a finance and networking, all right? You gotta, you gotta understand. All right, but you also never want to overpay. Now, there's a brother by the name of Don Peebles. He's actually either the or one of the biggest African-American developers in the United States. And he is swore by this, right? And he says sometimes he's even be able to pay more because he's a developer, though. So he can pay more to a seller with their land or their site because he can take a, a, a vacant piece of land and he can entitle it. And once he entitles it, right, and creates the rights to build on it, now, now that property is more valuable, right? So in those instances, you might be able to do that, right? You might be able to do that. However, that's, that's gonna be, again, the exception. The rule of thumb is that you're negotiating for terms. You kinda gotta, you know, negotiate that way and not try to beat people up on price, all right? Now also, you still got to make sure that there's a path for finance to, for, for, for positive cash flow, right? I got one of the, I started doing these presentations where we analyze cash flow, right? Where we analyze the cash flow model, income and expense, profit and loss, right? Now if you, if we talked about Carlton Sheets earlier, right? If you're doing Carlton Sheets deals, if you did his course, you knew the importance of positive cash flow. So don't just do a creative financing deal, right? Just because you can get in. And then, and then you get in, and it's a negative cash flow. I learned that on my first deal. I got in, no money. It was great. But the property needs so much work that we were at, that we were losing money. Right? So that, so you don't want to do that. Right? You got to make sure. That's a rule of thumb. You got to make sure you make money. All right? So you got to negotiate for terms. Make sure the property is, you know, making the cash flow. And then here's the other thing. Make sure all the documents get recorded. Make sure all the documents get recorded properly, all right? That is, properly is not you going down to Alameda County and, and trying to file some stuff, okay? Especially at Alameda County because they don't know what they're doing up in there. Let me just, I'm, if you work for the county, my bad. They don't know what they're doing in there, okay? They don't. What you got, you need to get, even if it's, if, even if it's a, a deal and you're not trying to pay title insurance and all that stuff, there's escrow companies out there that can record it properly for you. Give you an example. I told y'all about my first listing when my mom was divorced on the first hu fifth husband and all that, right? Well, when we went to go list that property, we sold it, right? Got an escrow. Not even now. We, they pulled the preliminary title, right? Beginning, you know, beginning of escrow, pre prelim, boom, right? We got loan docs. So that means we at the end. I'm basically got me a champ bottle of champagne and, you know, I, I had to buy that. I had to borrow from my partners to get some champagne at that point. We about to close, you know what I mean? We get to the closing table and then escrow's like, wait, wait, wait a minute, hold on, wait. Uh, there's, 
you guys don't really actually own the property. And I was like, you know, you know what do y'all mean? What do y'all, y'all, what's going on right now? You know what I mean? And what they told me was my mama, even though they had refinanced, right? They had a seller financing loan and they refinanced with hard money. That's what they did. Right? So when we go to closing property, closing table, what escrow told us was, yeah, we see that you, you know, you guys refinanced in this year, but the, 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 the woman who owned the property who carried financing to my mama, basically my mama and them, and my mama and her husband at the time, uh, went down to Alameda County, you know what I mean? And they, they did, now this is what we used to do back in the days, because this is how we did it. We go to the, but again, it's Alameda County, you know what I mean? You know, some, at 12 o'clock, not at 12 or 1, 12 o'clock, they shutting out, they going to lunch. So somebody missed, messed something up between the recording, and we went to close escrow. Mm-hmm. My mama wasn't, uh, uh, when they pulled the second prelim, my mama wasn't on title. Mm-hmm. So you know what we did? And first of all, we prayed to the Lord, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was, I was stressed, but we, found, we had to go find the woman mm-hmm. and have her to sign. I remember, like, I'm, I'm like, basically having a heart attack. Cause I'm like, what if she dead? She went, so my mom was like, that Miss Lester, she was like 80 years old. That was almost five, five, ten, six, however many years ago. We found her. She was cool, cause she could have also been like, all right, what well, I get out of? It. And what we was gonna do? Well, she was cool. She signed. So make sure when you do a deal like this, the documents are recorded. Now, where to caution on this? Lease options. Sometimes I know in Santa Clara County, I did a couple of them, and they wouldn't record them for me. However, um, I had a couple other investors like, nah, 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 you, it's, it's, no matter who you talk to um, when you do a lease option in Santa Clara County, you just have to get the right escrow company. There's a company called Green Escrow in, in uh, Pleasanton that if you're doing one of these, you probably, if you're doing this creative financing, you can work with Green Escrow. Now, Old Republic Title, who I work with, they do, they do a lot of this stuff too. You know, they, uh, the Old Republic downtown Oakland is very well versed on creative financing. Every escrow company is not, mm-hmm. all right? You got to understand that. And there's all kind of creative ways to close deals, double closings, all, you know, all this type of stuff. Wholesalers, like when we, back in the day, we would do, I did a short, I, did, I represented the buyers on a short sale lease option to buy, uh, ma- short sale master lease option to buy before. When, I, I didn't even know it was a short sale, right? I just came in and there was a lease option to buy, we put it there, we went through the whole thing. And we, again, got the we in escrow, getting ready to close, and, and dude was like, okay, it's going to take another 30 days. So I'm like, whoa, we got the money. What do you mean? We got everything together. Oh, we got to get the approvals from Wells Fargo because it was our short sale approval. If you know anything back from back in the day doing short sales, those are time sensitive. Mm-hmm. And, and that, so he was a wholesaler who had negotiated the short sale, sold it to us on the option. We came in and closed it, and it all worked out, all right? But that was a very... It, it worked out because he had a title company that was, you know, flexible enough to do a double close. He did a double close, right? So you have to make sure the documents are recorded. You have to make sure you got the right title company, all right? Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. Here are some of the top creative financing techniques and strategies. Not the only ones though. These are just the, these are the most prevalent, right? Now, master lease options. Now, I say master lease. Anytime you got more than one unit, it's a master lease. If it's a home or a condo or even a single tenant property where it's just one door, like a retail property, but it's only one door, then it would be a regular lease with an option to buy. As soon as you get more than one unit, whether that's retail, office, apartments, then what that's going to be is a master lease. You are leasing the entire building, master lease, and the option to buy works just like the traditional option to buy. You, You purchase an option. Be for a dollar, be for a hundred dollars. I recommend anywhere between one dollar and five percent of the purchase price. Right? You can go over five percent. The option consideration can be whatever you want, but understand this: as the option consideration is not an earnest money. Earnest money can be refundable given certain situations. Once you give the seller an option money, it's their money, mm-hmm. right? It ain't your money. Now it goes towards the purchase price. And then it goes towards the purchase price, but it's not refundable. You are purchasing an option for a period of time. That option gives you two months, two years, 10 years, a period of time. Now, some of y'all might uh, be involved in the stock market. I'm not so much a stock market, although I'm learning, 
But what I know is that a option to purchase property works just very similarly to an option, a stock option. You just essentially, you have a contract, a right to purchase that asset in a specific period of time. Same thing. Now, in a specific period of time, if you go a day past that spirit, specific period of time, you better hope that the person who sold you is a benevolent person. Because if, if you were one day late, they can be like, all right, well, you was late. And I got to keep it moving because I got this, you paid me this option that is time sensitive. In the stock market, it ain't no benevolency. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, real estate is a little bit more between the people. You know, this is between us. We can, we can make this happen. That's why I like real estate. You know, stock market is the cutthroat, ruthless and institutions. You miss by a half an hour, you out. You out all right? So mm-hmm. options are time sensitive. All right, now go through each one of these. But land contracts, contracts for deed, all right? Very similar to a, a, a lease option. A great way to structure creative <laughs> finance. A land contract or a contract for the deed is just what it is. It's an installment sale that is a contract for the deed, all right? It is not, okay, let me back up. When a lease option to buy, and I'll go through this, each one of these, you have what's called equitable title. You have rights to the title. You have equity in that title, but you don't own the deed. You don't have the title clearly. You have rights to it because you paid for an option that gives you two years, two, three, whatever the time is. You can buy that property. You can even sell that property. You have rights to the title. On the land contract, contract with deed, you got the same thing. You have rights to that title for a period of time. What's a little bit different is what's typical in an installment sale is that it is in an installment sale. There's installments along the way, okay? An option, or at least with the option to buy is you put up an option consideration, you pay a monthly amount in, in, in lease, and then over that period of time, you come and buy the property. Contract for deed or installment sale, land contract. In California, we call it contract for deed. I did a deal in Ohio, it's called land contract. Same thing, right? The deed of trust, deed, deed of trust, mortgage, you know, the language is different in different states. But land contract, contract for deed is an installment sale. So there's going to be periods of time where you need to make installment payments towards the purchase price. Give you an example. I sold a church in San Jose. And this was when the market was like 2010, 2011. Market wasn't back yet. And so I found a, a very difficult doing church property, by the way, especially in Silicon, Silicon Valley. They're not so friendly like we are here to the church community in uh, Allen County. So you have to find properties that are, because yeah, churches ain't paying property tax, by the way. That's what that is. So zoning was very difficult. We finally found one. And we structured an installment sale. So my client came. I represent the buyer. They said, hey, I'm going to put $50,000 down. Okay, we're going to buy this property. I'm going to say I think it was $1.2 million. Every quarter, right, every three months, we're going to put another $50,000 down. Until eight quarters go by, and then we're going to cash you out. All right? They're a church, so what do they do every quarter? They're raising the money through their parishioners, and then every quarter they came 50000 50000 50000 to the end of it. They brought all the money, and they paid. Very creative way. Now, that whole time, once they put their first 50 up, they be, that was their property. They got into the property. They occupied it. They're having church. They're making improvements to the property. They were, you know... All of which you can make improvements when you got a lease option contract fee. Now, if you don't come through, it's a risk. But there's real confidence because they knew that they had a church home and they had faith in the Lord and the Lord came through and the parishioners was there and it worked out for them. Now, agents and brokers, check this out. So we, uh, uh, I worked with the listing uh, broker on that, a guy from there, uh, a brother by the name of Carlos Padilla from Intero down in San Jose. A really good, uh, really good broker, by the way. Uh, him and his wife, top brokers in uh, San Jose. And so we got creative. We said, all right, look, each time there's money exchange, we'll get a little bit of commission. So we took, when the first 50000 came, we got a, he got a piece, I got a piece. The next 50000 came, he got a piece, I got a piece. Then, so it wasn't the whole lump sum that we all wanted, but, you know, um, uh, 10% of something is a lot better than 100% of nothing, right? <laughs> it was a way that we structured a deal. His clients was happy. My clients was happy. As agents and brokers were happy. Me and him, I, I'm shouting him out. Another agent, another broker, right? Down in San Jose, right? And I'm sure he's still, him and his wife, I'm sure they're still doing business, you know, because of the way they did business, you understand? So that was a great way. Wrap around mortgages. This is where 
the D you, you create now this on this one the D does transfer. All right, the D transfer. And I'm I'm gonna kind of go through each one, and then I have a, a page for each one, and I'll, I'll break down each one. But that's where the D transfers, and it's was it's called a wraparound mortgage because there may be an existing debt on a property mortgage, and then the seller can create a new mortgage. Say that existing debt is a million, they can create a 1.2 million dollar first lien, not second, that wraps around the existing mortgage. I'll explain what that means. The difference between the first two is the deed transfers. That's the difference. Seller carry the first or second deeds of trust, okay? First or second mortgages in other states. Um, California is a deed of trust state. Uh, I did a lot of business in Ohio. Ohio was a mortgage state. Texas, I think, is a deed of trust state. Florida, I want to say, is a mortgage state. But every, deed of trust, same thing, right? First position, that, that means they're senior. They're just like the bank. They're in first position. All right, second position is behind the bank, all right, or behind the person in first position. By the way, a great way to bridge the gap, to get a low money or no money down deal is to have the seller carry a second. If you can get a first position mortgage and you can have the seller carry a second, now the lender has to be uh, you know, cool with it. Some, some lenders are, some lenders ain't. Um, you just gotta pick your lender wisely. And they can carry financing behind that where maybe you only, commercial real estate, you got to put 30 to 40% down. So if they carry, let's say 20%, now you only have to put 10 or 20 percent down it's a lot better than 40. maybe it's not no money down but it's lower money down and we talked earlier that can increase your rate of return that's the traditional way for seller financing by the way that requires the, the seller to have a good amount of equity though all right joint venture partnerships okay it's uh, a lot john don people's a developer i just talked about um he has made his you know billions on this concept joint venture development you partner with someone who has equity in their property and then you guys get a partnership agreement, their equity is their stake in the deal. And then you guys go and either develop a property or you go and you come and you run it and renovate it or do whatever you're gonna do. And now you're partners. You, they basically use their equity in their property to get them a partnership stake in the new entity, all right? A little bit of a sophisticated way. This mainly happens in development deals, all right? Something that we're doing right now on International Boulevard. Crowdfunding, self-directed IRS 1031 exchanges. This is where you are utilizing other people's money. Remember, we talked about that as a method of other people of creative financing. You go out and find individuals who want to invest and put them together. And there's different crowdfunding platforms. People who have self-directed IRAs. People who are in 1031 exchanges. These are all great ways for people. You know, if you're putting a deal together, to find investors who may want to come invest now. Every time you bring in investors, you have to follow the rules. There's some specific rules on that. I'm not going into that now. I'm just going to give you the, the broad stroke of what you have to do. Now, in the bigger deal, which everybody in here can do, by the way. Everybody in here can do. Now, people started off, you know what I mean, in the business, small, he, he, he doing billion-dollar deals, okay? But in the bigger deals, you can do what's called preferred equity mezzanine structure finance. There's companies, there's funds out there that will invest money with you up to 90% of the down payment. So, that, But... But these companies, they typically ain't writing a check or sending a wireless of $5 million. So these deals would have to be at least 10 to $20 million in size. But in that world, like I told y'all, most of these big companies are doing structured finance deals. They're doing uh, preferred equity. They're working with private equity companies. They're working with hedge funds. And those, cap those couple of companies come and provide the capital to the sponsor. The sponsor is the one who puts the deal together. Now, you kind of got to crawl before you walk, right? You might want to do some uh, wraparound mortgages before you start doing structured finance. But I'm going to, I'm going to give, you all the, give you all the game on this because we all can get there. Now, I'm going to go through each one and we're going to wrap this up in about 10, 15 minutes, all right? I'm going to get y'all out of here. So, seller carry first or second deeds of trust. This is the most traditional way that we do creative financing. And this is where the deed does transfer, all right? This is, what, this is different than um, a, a land contract or a lease with option to buy. Close the escrow, deed transfer. Let me give you an example. We purchased the property in Stockton this year, or I'm sorry, 2022. And it's a 40 room SRO, single room occupancy hotel. We're gonna convert it to housing. That's what we're doing right now, by the way. I love Stockton. I think it's a great place to invest. The seller carried a second mortgage on it. It's 590. We got, I got a first mortgage. Um, at the time it was like four, uh, at the time it was 450. The, the, the seller, no, four and a quarter, the seller carried $100,000 on it. We came in, 
with about a hundred thousand dollars of equity, and that equity came from a couple of investors, and we 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 closed the deal, right? The seller carrying that second on the property was important for us to be able to get it get the deal, right? And that was it was a vacant property. He needed to sell it. So when we closed escrow, there was a 65% first, right? The seller, the seller carried 50, what did he, about 50, no, about 20%. And then we came in, it ended up being more than, we, 15% plus the closing cost. So we ended up coming in with a little over 20% down, right? Which, it ain't no money down, but it's a lot less than 40% uh, down. Do you agree? So that seller helped us to finance that deal, all right? Recently, we all closed the property um, in uh, San Paulo Print Shop in, um, in Oakland, and that, the buyer came in and put 30% down, right? So 30% is a hefty down payment. That ain't, in fact, a little bit more than that with closing costs and everything. The sellers carried 70% first mortgage, and they actually did it at a rate of interest, uh, I wanna say it was like, Four percent or high three percent. It was it was a rate of interest below the market. Now, why would the seller do that? Why would they do that? Because the interest rates on the mark on, on commercial right now are you know five and a half, maybe low sixes. Because the property needs a whole lot of work. Property's vacant, right? When they go to the marketplace. They're gonna have to take an extreme discount because of all those factors. Now they were able to get a reasonable price because of that first position mortgage. Now, and they also lowered their tax liability dramatically. And they've created an investment that represents a stream of income better than they would be getting in the bank and better than they would get within most uh, other investment institutions. And it's on an asset that they know very, very well, okay? That, so, so that's an example of first and second carry. That's the most <coughs> traditional way for you to do a seller financing deal, all right? That's the most traditional way. Now. Master lease option. Now we we'll talked a little bit about this so far. All right. So when we come and that, that, that you know you master lease the whole building, you put up a little bit of money. It could be a dollar, be a hundred thousand, whatever you negotiate. My guidance, anywhere from a dollar to five percent of the purchase price. All right. You negotiate that out. That's just because it ain't. Once you give that money to them, it's a wrap. All right. So so now that. Option consideration binds you, gives you equitable title, rights to the title for a period of time, right? It also goes towards the purchase price, all right? So you don't get it back and it is time sensitive, all right? Now, here's another thing about lease options that you can structure, is that you can structure to where a percentage of the monthly lease goes towards the purchase price. Mm -hmm. This acts like your principal pay down in a mortgage. You understand? Know Every time you make a mortgage payment, you get a little bit of principal on that. Another element of term about the return, by the way, a lot of people don't calculate principal pay down as a part of return in real estate, but it actually is a huge part of return. Because every time you make a mortgage payment, and those tenants, by the way, make your mortgage payment, you're building equity. Even if the market's going down, you're building equity because you're paying off that loan. All right? So you can structure that in. It's the Wild West, man. I, you know, it's typically anywhere from 10 to 20% of the payment is what I've seen. Any, any, anything above that, then the seller is like, nah, you know, you do, you, you do it too much, you know? Remember, we're negotiating for terms, so you don't be too greedy on this. But that is a way of how you can also build equity while you're in on the property. I talked a lot about these options, so I won't stay here too much on this, but this is a great way, y'all, to get in on properties right now. You got to be able to, though, on, on, on assets that are multifamily, you got to be able to roll your sleeves up and get, get the property operating. Because most people are doing this deal because they're either burnt out on the operations or they just don't want to deal with it no more, right? So that's the thing you got to be prepared to do. Now, I talked a lot about land contracts as well. And I broke down that, so I won't spend too much time on this. Other than to say, this is another great way for you to be able to structure a deal, to get into it, and... Get the seller a little bit, but if they lease option it to you, they're not going to get all their money until the end of it, right? They're not going to get their money until you exercise that option and you cash them out. If they need a little bit of money, but maybe they don't need it all right now, you can do an installment sale to where they get a lump, they get a lump, they get a lump, all right? The risk is if you come in with no money at all, 
You need to be able to figure out how you can get them they love. All right? But I did that deal with my church. The church, not my church, but the church I was working with, my brother-in-law's church. They had, they could look at their church and say, hey, look, we're bringing in X amount every single, every single um, Sunday for regular, you know, tithes and offerings, right? Uh, if you're in the church, you know, we have two th tithes and offerings, right? That's typical. What they would do, what they did is say, hey, we have X amount coming in tithes and offerings. What we're going to do is tell, uh, you know, the people is, hey, that we're looking to buy this property. Um, it's all going to be owned by the church. If you're able to give a little bit more on this particular fund, it's going to help us to buy this church, right? That was, but they was able to look and see, this is what we're bringing in now. And I bet we can bring a little bit more. And it was, in fact, they brought in a lot more because the people were like, hey, we in this over here, this, this other little church over here. This is not, we want this church building, right? And so we, they, we, they gave. And it was a great decision for them. The church is like quadrupled in value since then and size. So it was a great, but you need to make sure you have some sort of a way to deliver to them the installment payments. A good friend of mine now looking at a deal right now, and he's like, well, look, I can get this done. I can break down some payments. I've got a bunch of investors I can I can go and produce or approach this property right now is producing income. He, we me and him were talking about it last night. I said, I looked at it, I looked at the numbers. I said, look, man, this is good. And I would tell you if it didn't, because you're my boy. And But we, we looked at it, he said, hey, man, I probably can get them all the money now. But if we space it out, I take control day one. He could take over the business and the building and based on what he's doing, he could probably double the income in two or three months. So he might be able to also pay off some of that property with the income that he has, you know, generating from that from that property. So that is the that is the benefit of when you do uh, an installment sale called the contract with the state of California. Ohio at least is called a uh, land contract. Other states have been buried. So that's part of the benefits of it. All right. Now. Wrap around more. This is the one I'm, I want to bust down a little bit more, okay? Because I, I kind of skimmed over this one, all right? But I've done a few deals. I heard somebody say that maybe either earlier today or... No, I, I'm sorry. I heard that on the conference call I was on today, all right? I was talking with some finance cats, and we were talking about that. Because how many of y'all heard of assumable mortgages, all right? It's where you can assume an existing mortgage. Big thing right now, by the way. Bunch of loans got done in 2021 at 3%, 2%, whatever, all right? Legally, you can go and assume the loan, right? And I'm going to say, I mean, wraparound mortgage is legal too. However, the bank going to say no about that. By the way, you know everything that the bank writes down is, and they tell you this is the law or this ain't necessarily the law. It is their policy, right? The banks, you know, the banks, they're making all kinds of policies, by the way. You know, they don't have nothing to do with the law. But they put something in your loan. It's called a due on sale clause. So when the property trades on the sale, the loan is due, right? However, however, legally, you can do what's called a wraparound mortgage. In fact, on your, on your California broker's exam, if you take a broker's exam, there's going to be a wraparound mortgage called what's called an all-inclusive deed of trust, right? All-inclusive. It includes the existing financing. So let's just say, give me an example. This is a deal I did back in the day. There was a $750,000 mortgage on the property, right? And he was behind. We're trying to figure out how to sell the property. This is right before the market crash. We got this brother out of this property months before the market crash, right? He was behind. So buyer came in. Buyer came in and said, all right, I'm going to buy this property for $900,000. And I'm going to put down fifty k, And then you're going to carry an eight hundred and fifty dollars wraparound mortgage. So the first mortgage is seven fifty, dollars right? The, sec the, the mortgage that we create, which is also in senior position, this is why it's called a wraparound, of 850, then wraps around the existing 750 loan. So close of escrow, deed transfer. Okay, buyer got the, 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 the deed, seller got his $50,000. What happens every month is the buyers pay the seller, right? Seller gets the money, seller takes that money, pays the mortgage. There's a lot of risk in this tactic, all right? A lot of risk in this tactic. But it's a, it is a great way, especially in, in this market where mortgage interest rates in, in past are a lot lower than they are today. And for, if a seller's in a bind and they can't sell the property, <coughs> it's tough. Now, as a buyer, what you want to do is make sure you set up an escrow. So you don't just give that seller their money. If they can take that money and not make the payment and you look up one day, because that bank, they still got that first loan. They can foreclose upon that. 
right? Mm -hmm. set, so you have to make sure the seller makes their payment. The way you do that, you set up a mutual third-party escrow to where, hey, when you make your payments, that automatically, the payment to the bank automatically gets paid. And whenever it's left over, it goes to the seller, all right? That's called a wraparound mortgage, all-inclusive deed of trust. A little bit of risk involved in that, but if you know what you're doing, it could be an excellent way for you to acquire properties and make a lot of money on the bank's money, all right? Now, in residential, it, well, there's a concept called subject to. You heard of subject to? Mm -hmm. Similar concept. You take over the mortgage subject to, take over the property subject to the existing mortgage. The deed transfers to you. You got the deed, all right? That's what's different than a, um, a lease option or, or a land contract. The deed comes to you but now subject to the existing mortgage terms. Now again, the bank don't know about that, right? If they find out, they can call the loan. They have that right. Because again, it's not illegal. Let me just be clear about that, everybody. Instagram and YouTube and them, uh, everybody, all right? But they can call the loan, all right? These are risks that you take. So if you, as buyer or seller, you know, you make sure you understand those risks. You would only do that if the deal makes enough sense. But it is an option. It is a way to make a deal work. It is a way to get it done. All right? Especially, I think, right now, it's a good option because interest rates are so high, or at least higher, than they used to be. But if you do a subject to, or you do a wraparound mortgage, you got to make sure you get professionals involved. you got to make sure everything is recorded. you got to make sure you use a neutral third party. All right? And you got to make sure you're on top of the deal. Now... I'm going to start talking a little bit more about other people's money and the concept of syndications, raising capitals, funds. Basically, now you're saying, hey, maybe you found a great deal. The seller don't want to carry no finance. You don't have all the down payment. What do you do? All right. Well, then you raise capital. You know, what's called a syndication. All right. And there's a, now, let me just say, there's a whole different ways, a whole different, a whole lot of different ways that you can raise capital. You can raise capital through a fund. You can raise capital directly for a property. You can go and uh, crowdfund uh, a project. Essentially, what we're talking about is just going out to other private individual investors, offering them a percentage of your deal. There's a lot of rules you need to follow when you do this, all right? A lot of rules that you need to follow. I'm not gonna talk, that's why I don't wanna, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not, I'm not going into legal advice, but what I can say is this, you want, if you're gonna do this, you get a lawyer, a business lawyer. There used to be a really good business lawyer by the name of Bill Taylor in Oakland. And he was, and he retired, but he would, he would do our stuff and he was really good, right? So you need to make sure you get somebody that knows what they're doing and they structure your legal documents so that now people can come and invest with you and you have the proper legal documentation, right? But this is a great way to go out and make things happen together. I just did a talk last month. Um, it was at the Black Wealth Summit and there was a guy by the name of Cedric Nass. By the way, you want to check out his book. It's called Why Should White Guys Have All the Wealth? Cedric Nash. Now, there was a book written a while ago called Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun by Reginald Lewis, who was, um, he was, he was in the mergers and acquisitions business, right? The buyout business. But this book is just about building wealth, particularly in a black community, but it's actually, it's applicable to anyone, and everyone should read this. But it's not only for, you know, white men who have most of the majority of uh, equity, you know, in our country. You know what I mean? Anyone, when he says, can build equity. It's not just for them, all right? And there's some steps that you need to take in order to go ahead and do this. And raising capital, collective economics, is a great way to do it, all right? In his book, he, great book. But one thing he, he mentions about the, the black African-American community, and I say that African-American, a lot of blacks that are like my wife, she's Ethiopian, she's black, she's Ethiopian. And then she's African too, but they're gonna let you know that she's Ethiopian, you know what I mean? Let it be known, right? They're real particular with that, right? For African-American black folks, our dollar stays in our community, unfortunately, only six hours. Now, I don't know how they measure this. You know what I'm saying? You know? But now I can tell you in the Ethiopian community, oh, no, no, no. They, they, they money stay in a whole lot longer. Right? And I've had, the, I've had the opportunity to witness that, see their family, see how they operate, you know what I mean? Um, and see how they get out. My son, when we went to Ethiopia this, this uh, uh, summertime, Got to go chance to see where um, they made his grandfather, um, my, my wife's daddy. They made him a library in in a in a in, a, in, a, in where their church is. It's a castle, right? It's a castle from like the 1600s. And understand, Ethiopia was never colonial, uh, colonialized. 
right? They were, they were occupied by the Italians, but they were never colonialized. So in this area, you know, the feudal area where England, they had castles and all, Ethiopia and them had castles too. And so where his granddaddy, it's a, they built a, a library for him. Now, how did they build that library? They didn't go to Goldman Sachs and get, uh, you know, $10 million loan. You know what they did? They sent out a text to the family, hey, we put everybody, we need y'all to kick in a couple hundred dollars a month. We're going to kick in every month. We're going to send some money down, you know what I mean, and make this happen, you know? And they collectively came together, and we, when we went out there, we, we seen the, uh, 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 the castle and the, and the library, and that's what they did, right? So this is possible. And we look at some of the, like, like the Asian culture is really good with this, you know? They put money together. And they go for better work. Now, everybody's, they say Asian, there's Chinese, Filipinos, Vietnamese, everybody. But that's a cultural thing. Jewish culture, it's a cultural thing. You know what I mean? Our culture in America, we've been stripped of that because of the, the whole history of, you know, slavery and all that. But if you look at other cultures, there's a model of success, of collective economics. Does every deal work? Does every family work together? No, of course not. But if we as business people in America... Whether we black, Hispanic, Asian, white, Jewish, doesn't matter. If we figure out how we can work together, and by the way, it doesn't mean if you support black business or you're a black folk and you support other black folk, that doesn't mean you can't do business with other people. And in fact, you should do business with other people when it's appropriate, mm -hmm. right? And one thing about like black organizations or black, anything I've been a part of, we are absolutely welcoming to everyone, you know what I mean, in terms of doing business. The issue is we ain't doing enough business with each other, right? And that's something I think we can be solved through collective economics and this, this concept of syndications and raising capital and going and doing deals. Not to be warned that there's not pitfalls, though. Because when you raise money from people and investors, mm -hmm. you got to deal with the people and you got to deal with the investors. And sometimes there's some great people and sometimes there's some not so great people, right? And if you are a person that is investing with someone, sometimes there's going to be somebody who's a good operator. Sometimes there'll be somebody who don't know what they're doing, right? Sometimes it's gonna be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, what is the people, um, Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know what I mean? They, they get, I, don't, I mean, it's, I, there was, I read something about the returns they made last year and the year before that, when, last year when a lot of people lost money, you know, they made out these outrageous returns. Well, they, you know, they BlackRock, they got a way of making money. Same year, there was, was the guy from the crypto, what's, what's crypto cuz name? The crypto guy from FTX? Freed. Freed. Right? He didn't make that great of returns last year, right? You know what I mean? Whatever he did or didn't do, whatever it was. But, you know, though, that's the warning of it. But don't let that stop you from getting involved. Now, you can start with a couple of different investors. You know, you can start in a corporate enterprise. But the bottom line is we to collectively put capital together and make something happen. That is a creative way of financing deals and getting into deals. All right? It ain't easy. All right? I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to be about late. It ain't easy. It ain't easy, but it's worth it. Now, hard money, and I got hard money, structured finance, these are institutions, companies that will lend to you based on equity, right? Structured finance is really for bigger deals. This is for really for like the institutional deals, which we all can get in, by the way. And maybe that's not our first deal, but maybe we can work our way. That's my dream. You know what I mean? I want to own me one of these buildings in downtown Oakland, man. Shoot. You know, one of these hotels, one of these high rises and stuff like that. That's why I'm struggling and hustling. You know, but I, I'm getting in how I live in East Oakland right now, in Stockton. And one day, maybe we can move up that way. Because the, I, by, it, the same principle applies. You buy the fourplex, you're putting some investors together. You buy the fourplex, you're having them carry financing. The same principle that could be for uh, a 40-story building. You know what I mean? Hard money lenders will lend to you based on the property's value today, also possibly based on the property's value, the after-repair value, when it's fixed up, when it's renovated, Okay. Those are the different options that are available to you, all right? So as I wrap this up, and this is it, we all done. As I wrap this up, it's not one way of doing things, it's not. It's a whole bunch of different ways of doing things, right? I've laid out to you what I've, over my career since 03 and since 09 I started the company, what I've learned, what I've done, what we've structured, right? What I've observed, what I've read about, all of these things. But each one of those, those techniques I broke down was something I've actually done before. There's other ones. I can't speak on something that I, I'm not an expert on. I can't speak on something I ain't did before. 
you might go find the next strategy and technique. You know what I mean? And I and I and I challenge you to do that. I encourage you to do that. I hope that you do that. Look around what's going on. Look around right here. And this is just a small microcosm of what's going on. If you look at uh your brothers earn your leisure, you know what I mean? And that podcast, why that podcast is so successful, right? Is that they're taking information and getting it to people who typically would not have had it before. They're pointing their market in the black community, but you know what? It's not just the black community who's eating this up. It's a lot of people who, the institutions of the world, the corporate America of the world, the establishment of the United States was not feeding this information to us. Basically the concept of business ownership and investing. And this concept is catching fire. And interestingly enough, it's catching fire in the black community. It's catching fire in the urban serve community. Uh, women is the biggest section. Women, not just in the United States, but in the world, is the biggest section of new entrepreneurs. In the last, I think, three years, definitely the last two years, definitely the pandemic. So what's happening is there's a revolution going on. Creative financing is a great way to spark that growth, a great way for you to build equity, and so more importantly, is a great way to solve problems in times of distress. So go out there, swing the bat, stay tapped in with us. If you're not on our YouTube channel, make sure that you're on our YouTube channel. We got content. We busting our content every week, every week, on YouTube and IG. We have, and now we're back in person, so we're gonna be doing our we're gonna be doing a seminar next month. We'll see what we're gonna be talking about. I'm probably gonna have, um, you know, I'll probably have a guest come in and talk about, you know, some. I'll figure out the topic. But stay tapped in with us, stay networked up, and I really, really thank y'all and appreciate y'all. 